Welcome. My name is Deborah Gonzalez. I am a new, the newest director of uh, government affairs for PPIC, so be kind to me. Um, this is my first introduction. I want to thank you for joining us today. For those who are not familiar with PPIC, um, it's a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank with, with offices in San Francisco and Sacramento. Um, one of the reasons I was excited about joining PPIC is the evidence-based research and bringing it to connecting it with public policy, and I think that's a very exciting part of the organization. Today's event is part of the James Irvine Foundation briefing series, and we want to thank them for making this event possible. For today's presentation, we're going to hear from PPI re PPIC researcher Shannon McConnell. Sorry about that, Shannon. I knew I would get it wrong, even though we said that who will discuss her report, Expanding Health Insurance Coverage in California, County Jails as Enrollment Sites. I'd also like to acknowledge Mia Bird, who is a co-author of the report, who is also here today and will be available for questions. We'd like to thank the California Wellness Foundation for the support of this important work. The report, as well as the briefing slides from today's presentations, are now available on the PPIC website at ppic.org. A few more things before we begin. Next Thursday, there's another opportunity for beer bread and really good data um, in this same room. So please join us to learn about improving graduation rates at the state's, uh, California State University system. And then on May 23rd, we'll be at the Sheraton discussing poverty and inequality. Later today, you will receive a short survey via email, and we will ask that you please take a few moments to fill that out. We really do value your input. And finally, please silence your phones, because um, this report is very helpful, and I think you, that would be a distraction to you and to the researchers. Now on to the presentation. Shannon will, is a researcher associate from PPIC whose research interests include healthcare access, utilization, and outcomes among vulnerable populations. And after the presentations, we'll have Q&A um, from the audience. And now I'll turn it over to Shanna, and Mia will answer some questions too. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> That's great. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-author, Mia Bird, um, and also the California Wellness Foundation, who supported the work that we did for this report um, and is also providing support to us as we continue um, kind of a, our broader research agenda, which is focused on trying to understand this, this intersection between health coverage, coverage expansions under the Affordable Care Act and what they might mean for California's uh, county correctional systems. And so we start with some background on changes in um, coverage across California since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so I'm sure many of you know the Affordable Care Act um, was major uh, federal health reform. It provided for several things, um, among them coverage expansions to California's Medicaid program, Medi-Cal, um, and also uh, provided options for federally subsidized coverage that could be purchased through the new insurance marketplace that's covered California. Um, and so what we saw in 2014, the first year of ACA implementation in the state of California, was that California's uninsured rate dropped by nearly five percentage points, um, from about 17.2% to about 12.4%, which represents about 2 million additional Californians who, who gained insurance coverage. Um, still, in 2014, more than 4 million California residents um, lacked comprehensive health insurance coverage. Um, and while some more slightly more recent data covering the period, uh, the first nine months of 2015, suggests that California has continued to see lowered uninsured rates. That, that information tells us that there's still well over 3 million people in California that do not have insurance coverage, and other estimates suggest many of them are likely eligible for free or subsidized coverage that's available under the ACA. Um, and so kind of with the success and with these coverage gains that California has made, uh, there's growing recognition that those that are still part of the remaining uninsured population um, may be a harder to reach group than those that have already, that have already be become covered. Um, in part, uh, this is because, you know, the, the state, along with several other organizations, really made some, some large and sizable investments in, in providing outreach and enrollment activities leading up to the Affordable Care Act implementation in 2014 and in the few, first few years. So there have been sizable investments to get out the word, um, try to enroll those that, that could be eligible. And so again, our, 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 the thinking is that those that are still outside of health insurance are, are likely a harder to reach group. 
And so we, you know, you kind of can think about needing an alternative strategy, strategies to engage, to engage this group. Um, and so in, in recognition that certain groups, um, and these are groups that likely have, that had high uninsured rates, um, would be harder to reach. Um, in 2013, the legislator, legislature allocated up to $25 million um, to fund outreach and enrollment activities for the Medi-Cal program that were targeted to some very specific um, hard to reach groups. These included the homeless, these included people who may have mental health conditions, and they also included individuals who are under county or state correctional supervision. So this includes our county jails, our state prisons, county probation, state parole, and also kind of the new group post community supervision. Um, again, this outreach was for California's Medi-Cal program, um, which under the ACA extends coverage to single adults without dependent children who do not have disabilities and who have low income levels. And so that's kind of the, the big expansion group. Um, and so according to an estimate, it's a national estimate um, put out by the National Institute of Corrections, um, they, they suggest that as many as 35% of adults nationwide who became newly eligible for, for Medicaid, so when we're talking about Medicaid throughout the country, it's Medicaid in California, it's Medi-Cal, as many as 35% of those newly eligible adults um, had criminal, likely have criminal justice histories. And so there is thought to be the sizable overlap between these, between these groups. Um, and finally, it's important to put enrollment efforts targeted at our county jail populations in the context of public safety realignment. Um, and so public safety realignment was passed um, in 2011. It shifted responsibility for lower level felons from the state's prison system down to um, local correctional agencies to county jails. Um, it also created incentives as well as resources um, for local correctional agencies to focus on improving reentry outcomes, to try to target and reduce uh, high recidivism rates that, that are observed, um, in part by providing, we call them reentry programming, but these are, these are kind of coordinated, thinking about coordinated services and supports that can be provided to jail inmates who are tr transitioning back into the community um, to try to avoid further contact with the criminal justice system. And so the thought being here is that health coverage newly available under the ACA could be a part of a more comprehensive reentry strategy for those that are involved in the, in the jails, with the jails. And so here's just kind of a quick outline of the rest of the presentation. Um, first, I'll describe in a little bit more detail the characteristics of um, Californians who did continue to remain un uninsured in a post-ACA environment. Um, then I'll highlight some information we have on California's jail population um, from a new data source that um, is a new data collection effort uh, from PPIC, from state agencies, as well as 12, 12 partner counties in the state to, to gather more information about um, California's county jail populations. And finally, I'll discuss the enrollment assistance programs that are under development and being implemented um, in our county jail systems in the state. So we start first with a look at who was still uninsured in California in 2014. And so I'll note all of the information on the uninsured that I'm presenting is from 2014. Here we rely on um, the American Community Survey. It's a large household survey conducted by the census every year. Um, and so while it is maybe a little bit older um, than some other sources, we use this, it's a, it has a very large sample which allows us to do some really detailed analysis of subgroups. Um, and it also has consistently asked about insurance coverage over time, which better facilitates our making comparisons to a, a pre-ACA or, or before 2014. So all of these are from 2014. Um, so here, this is just, this is the age distribution of those that are remaining uninsured. The orange bars are the proportion of the uninsured population that falls into each of the age ranges that are across there. Um, the green bars are the share of California's total adult population that also falls into those, those age bins there. Um, and what you see is, you know, not surprisingly, that the uninsured are disproportionately younger relative to California's adult population. Um, the largest difference being in this group, age 25 to 34. 
Um, they comprise, that, that group comprises nearly 30% of those that are remaining uninsured in the state, um, but just under 20% of the adult population. Um, and what you do see here is the vast majority of those that are uninsured are really under age, age 44. The, the, two, the two largest groups comprise about 60%, or the two youngest groups, I'm sorry, age 18 to 24 and age 25 to 34 make up about 60% of people who are, were still uninsured in 2014. Um, obviously, differences decline considerably for those at older ages. Over 65, there's, there's Medicare, and so we've always had very low uninsured rates for that, for that group. Um, here we're focusing in on young men in particular, um, are much more likely to continue to be uninsured as they were before the ACA, but post-ACA. Um, so the first bar is the total remaining uninsured population in 2014. The second bar is the total population. Um, and the, the green section is the, the share of the uninsured and then the total population that are males age 18 to 44, the, while the orange bar is kind of everybody else. Um, what this shows us is, um, what we see is that um, among males age 18 to 44, they comprise less than one-fifth of the um, total state population and they're over 35% of those that remain uninsured. So they are this, this sizable group. And here, there's a, perhaps a lot going on, but here's just a few more um, additional characteristics um, of, of those who still lacked coverage in 2014. So the figure shows changes in uninsured rates. Uh, the orange bars are 2013, the green bars are 2014. Um, the first set of bars, this is by educational level. Um, so, so what you can see here clearly across all of these groups is that we did, uh, across all groups, there were declines in uninsured rates from 2013 in just the one year, 2013 to 2014. Um, but the other thing to point out is that even in 2014, rates remain high for, for some of the most disadvantaged groups in the state. So here, the first bar, we have that, that first one, uh, no high school degree. Um, despite a, a pretty sizable decline, about 35% of people without a high school degree are still uninsured in 2014, you know, compared to those with a high school degree and those with a college degree. Um, the second kind of set of bars, this is looking at employment status. Uh, so this middle, this middle bar here, this is those that are unemployed. So this is they're in the labor force seeking work but, but without employment. Um, so again, large declines in, in uninsured rates from 2013 to 2014, but still uninsured rates above 30% uh, for those that are unemployed. Um, and finally, the last set is um, by poverty rates. Um, and here, the, the cutoffs here on the bottom, the categories are um, associated with eligibility thresholds for the different insurance coverage programs that are under uh, the, the ACA in the state. So this first one under 138% of the federal poverty level, that's about 16 to 17,000 for a single adult in annual income. Um, that's the threshold to qualify for, the income threshold to qualify for the Medi-Cal program. And, uh, and then 138 to 250%, still a pretty low, low income level, but for that group, while they're over the, the Medi-Cal eligibility threshold, they are eligible for fairly sizable premium subsidies through Covered California. They're also eligible for cost-sharing subsidies. So in addition to getting federal assistance on buying coverage, um, they also are eligible for subsidies um, to, for the cost-sharing portion. So that's when you visit a doctor, when you need tests, those sorts of things. So they are subsidized on that level as well. Um, and so again, and, and this really is in some ways the group that was kind of targeted lower income people. The Affordable Care Act was trying to find affordable coverage options for the large group of people who are outside of being able to, to have insurance coverage. And so again, we see, you know, declines, but, but still 30% of um, people under 138% are, are continue to be uninsured in 2014. Um, so one thing that you may think is driving some of this and something that I haven't touched on yet is that undocumented immigrants um, were largely excluded from coverage expansions under the Affordable Care Act. Um, we also, the, 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 what we do know about un undocumented immigrants in, in the state is that they also have relatively low levels of education, lower income levels, larger shares of young people and men, and so you may be concerned that some of what we're seeing here is being driven by the state's relatively large population of undocumented immigrants. 
And so to assess that possibility, what we wanted to do was really examine the likelihood that an individual was uninsured in 2014 in, in more depth. And so everything that I've shown you so far um, has really just looked at two things in isolation, whether a person wasn't insured and then, then one characteristic, whether it be their education level, whether it be their age, and those sorts of things. And so what we've endeavored to do here is we wanted to examine the likelihood that a person in 2014 was uninsured, uh, analyzing and controlling for a whole host of different characteristics simultaneously. Um, these include sex, age, education level, race, ethnicity, employment status, marital status. Um, and, and fortunately, we were also able in these models to include um, an indicator, a, a flag, where uh, that indicates the, uh, the, that a person is likely or could be an undocumented immigrant. So it is just, it's a proxy measure, although it it's, was developed by uh, other researchers at our organization as part of our California poverty measure, and they've done a lot of work to see, and so it's, it's really a good way for us to, to try to control for some of that. So in all of these results that I'm presenting here in this model, we have endeavored to control for a person being undocumented, and these likelihoods that a person remains uninsured are among the population that is not thought to be undocumented. Um, and so what we see here is across the board, so it's these differing levels of disadvantage. And here we're defining disadvantage by education level, by income, and by employment status. And so the first set, the high disadvantage group, these are individuals that do not have a high school degree, who are not employed, and who have poverty levels below 138% of the federal poverty line. Um, and then for each of these groups, the other thing that we've done here is these are, these are the predicted probabilities of still being uninsured for Latino males age 25 to 34, white males age 25 to 34, and African American males age 25 to 34. That's what the bars are. So, so what we see here is so among this high disadvantage group, those again, low education, low income, not employed. Um, for Latino males age 25 to 34 that are, that are thought to be not documented, obviously, again, it's, it's just a proxy, um, they have uninsured rates in 2014 of about 65%. Um, whites and African Americans, the likelihood goes down significantly, but they remain over 50%. So um, among young men in high levels of disadvantage, uninsured rates seem to be remaining stubbornly high even in a post-ACA environment. Um, and basically, you can walk across it in the report. There's more detail about the medium disadvantage and low disadvantage categories, but those are higher incomes, they're unemployed, they might have higher education levels. But you see there are clear declines, but that this, you know, our focus here is really this high disadvantage group um, still having high uninsured levels, um, even after controlling for undocumented status. Okay, so now we're gonna shift to the county jail population. And so we do have some information available um, uh, to us on the state's overall county jail population. Uh, this comes from the jail profile survey, uh, which is information that's collected monthly by the Board of State and County, uh, the Board of State and County Corrections. I'm gonna call it the BSCC. I might mention it before because that's just easier for me to to get out, um, but they collect this information from all uh, local jurisdictions across the state and uh, measure the size of their, their jail populations. And so from this data source, we know that in 2014, on average, um, kind of in any given day across the state, about 80,000 people, uh, 80,000 inmates were being housed in California's county jails. There is dynamics over time, and actually there's other work that PPIC has done that examines kind of changes in the jail population and these different sorts of things. So if you're interested in kind of that, you should, I would encourage you to go to our website and look at some more of, more of that information. Um, and so again, the, this 80,000 is based on, it's called average daily population, ADP, and what, what that number really masks is a significant flow through our county jail systems. Um, Individuals stay in county jails for relatively short periods of time, uh, particularly in comparison to, say, our state prison systems. Um, I believe the median length of incarceration is somewhere between two and three weeks. So you really do have a large number of individuals that are moving through our county jail systems. 
Um, according to national data on local jails, um, they estimate that the number of admissions to local jails throughout the country is somewhere between 14 and 15 times the size of the ADP that's observed. Um, if we apply that ratio or, or that multiplier to uh, the observed uh, ADP in California, that's it, which suggests that California jails had over 1 million admissions um, over the course of 2014. Now, this is admissions, so you know, people, not necessarily individuals, people could have multiple admissions um, at a time, but, but it does kind of give you a sense to go from 80,000 to more than a million, that there's, there's a lot that's not being seen when we look at some of this other information. And so what we're going to use, oh, I've skipped ahead, sorry. Uh, so the information that I'm going to present on the jail population, again, is coming from um, this new data source uh, that's PPIC, the BSCC, and uh, 12 collaborating counties. Um, it's called the multi-county study. It, you might also hear us call it the MCS. Um, but it's uh, endeavoring to collect individual level information from these 12 representative county jail systems throughout the state. Um, it was created uh, after public safety realignment in order to help state and county government really understand what was going on, um, to allow them to evaluate outcomes and you know, changes over time in what was happening from this kind of major correctional change. Um, and so again, all of the figures that I'll be showing on the jail population are from this MCS data. Um, the 12 counties do represent, uh, were selected to be representative of the state. Uh, they include about two-thirds of the state's total population and jail population and are dispersed kind of throughout different regions, although other counties in the state could, could, look, could look differently. Um, but we are, you know, it, capturing a, a large portion of um, the jail population in the state of California. And so first, this is kind of a duplicate of that first figure on the uninsured, looking across the age, age ranges for, for the jail population. Um, maybe not surprisingly, jail inmates tend to be younger adults, like we saw amongst the uninsured, even more so skewing towards, so, towards younger age groups. Um, so the orange bars uh, show the share of the total jail population that falls into each of the age categories, while the green bars show the share of the total adult population that is in that same set of 12 counties that we're studying in, in the MCS. It's, they're, not, they're not different from, from the total state population, but, but we do restrict um, the, the shares of the, the adult population to just those 12 counties. Um, and so what you see again is you know, really, really concentrated in these, in these younger age categories. The largest differences between the jail population and the adult population being in the age 18 to 24 and the age 25 to 34 category. Um, about 60% of the jail population is in those groups compared to less than 35% of the total adult population. Um, and we also see that jail inmates, um, so this is just showing the, the gender differences and race ethnicity differences in the jail population. Jail inmates are predominantly male. This is not surprising. It's consistent with across local, state, and federal correctional institutions. Their populations tend to be predominantly male. Um, so in the MCS counties under study, almost 80% of uh, jail inmates are, are men. Um, I will say that females seem to comprise a larger share of California's local jail population relative to, say, the state's uh, prison population, uh, where it's, uh, I think it's just under 10% are females versus um, in the MCS counties, about 22% of the jail population in 2014 was female. Um, when we look at the race ethnicity, so that's these set of bars, we see that non-whites are overrepresented amongst the jail population. So almost 45% of California's jail population is Latino, another 30% is white, and about 20% is African American. Uh, African Americans in particular are disproportionately represented in California's jail population, which is true across you know, federal and, and state correctional institutions. African Americans are disproportionately uh, represented in, in the incarcerated group. And so uh, we also know uh, from other information sources uh, that jail inmates and correctional populations in general have relatively high health needs um, compared to the general population and especially considering their younger age profiles. Um, so they have higher rates of infectious diseases, uh, hepatitis, tuberculosis, also higher uh, rates of chronic conditions, hypertension, and asthma. 
um, and also much higher prevalence of behavioral health issues. This is mental health conditions and substance use disorder conditions. Um, according to national statistics, about 60% of local jail inmates have symptoms of mental health disorders, and more than two-thirds meet the criteria for substance dependence or substance abuse. So clearly, the, the behavioral health needs are very large for, for this population. Um, and so then in kind of thinking, why might local correctional agencies want to focus on connecting inmates to insurance coverage? Um, as we've already mentioned, it can be part of a comprehensive reentry strategy um, to avoid further contact with the justice system, which in turn will help jails kind of manage their population and, and meet some of their goals. Um, it also has potential to lower correctional health costs. Um, local jails, like state prisons, are constitutionally mandated to provide medical and mental health care um, that's needed for, for their inmate population. Um, to the extent that inmates can get connected to, to coverage and care outside of custody, that could improve their conditions once they are in custody um, and their level of need when incarcerated, which in turn could, could, or could lower uh, jail uh, health costs. Um, there's also some, some evidence that Medicaid coverage improves treatment rates among people released from jails um, that have mental health conditions and also lowers the likelihood of future arrests. So there is, there is it's not large, but there is an evidence base that does suggest that health coverage, Medicaid coverage in particular, could have an impact on, on recidivism rates. Um, and finally, according to, again, kind of what limited information we have and estimates, um, it's thought that the majority of the jail population is likely eligible for Medi-Cal based on their low incomes, Med Medicaid or Medi-Cal based on their low incomes. And so here I just wanted to, to kind of highlight uh, a, a few recent changes that have been going on in the Medi-Cal program specifically um, that could prove to be particularly beneficial to the jail population. Um, first, there are ongoing efforts uh, to better integrate the provision of physical and mental health, behavioral health, within the Medi-Cal program. I mean, there's, there's recognition that these two are, are very related, that one affects the other in terms of utilization rates and, and people's health outcomes. And so there really is this acknowledgement and, and attempts to better integrate the, the service provision for, for these things. Most Medi-Cal beneficiaries are now covered under managed care plans. Um, and so a lot of health plans are also really endeavoring to figure out ways to better connect these, these two pieces. Um, uh, to better serve uh, people who may have mental health and physical health needs. Um, there's also an overhaul of Medi-Cal's drug Medi-Cal program. This is the element or the aspect of Medi-Cal that provides treatment and services for substance use disorders. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, which I hadn't mentioned. The Affordable Care Act broadly, uh, behavioral health conditions are now one of 10 essential benefits. And so what that has meant is for both Medi-Cal beneficiaries, Medi-Cal managed care plans, and other health plans for everyone, there is kind of more, uh, hopefully, more access to treatment, more coverage and access um, to treatment for mental health conditions and substance use disorder conditions. And that includes in, in the Medi-Cal program. Um, so, and then finally, there's, uh, there's some other pilot programs and other things that are happening within Medi-Cal. Uh, the Department of Healthcare Services, one of them is a pilot program that DHCS is um, developing along with their counties under the new 1115 Medicaid waiver. Um, these are called whole person care pilot programs. Um, and these are really focused on providing more intensive health and social services, case management, um, connections to housing, if, if, if that's a need, to, to groups of individuals who have high health needs, who have high utilization rates, um, in an effort to produce better outcomes, but also in an effort to control costs with, for, for the program. Um, along similar lines, um, the, the, the state is applying the Affordable Care Act included a provision, a section where states could, through their Medicaid programs, create health homes. We have health homes for patients with complex needs. The state is in the process of kind of developing those. And again, these health homes are really targeted towards high need, high utilizing patients that likely have multiple chronic conditions that may have behavioral health conditions and trying to think about how to provide case management and coordinated care in order to better manage, better manage their health. 
And so finally, uh, you know, to focus on how, how county jail systems are endeavoring to provide enrollment assistance to, to jail inmates. Um, we do know from a, a, a fairly recent survey of counties uh, that most uh, county correctional agencies do recognize the possibilities that coverage expansions under the Affordable Care Act could offer to those that are, are in, the, in their county jails. And so most are actively developing and or implementing some type of enrollment assistance for, for their jail populations. Um, and as they think through these enrollment assistance programs, um, there's a lot of variations across counties. There's a lot of differences um, and decisions that, that need to be made in terms of how best to, to design and, and implement uh, enrollment assistance for jail, jail inmates. Um, so one of these would be funding. How do you fund enrollment assistance? Um, counties are using various sources of funding for this. Um, these include, as I mentioned, the AB82 outreach and enrollment funds through, through the Medi-Cal program. Uh, some are using public safety realignment dollars that were allocated for, for reentry. Um, there's also Medi-Cal uh, state administrative funds. Um, in some cases, county general funds. So, you know, and, and how they decide to finance and fund enrollment assistance has implications both in terms of the scope of the program, how many people they, they can reach, but also, and maybe more importantly, the sustainability of, of enrollment assistance programs within, within the jail system. Um, there are also differences that could impact their enrollment programs in terms of the relationships that counties have between their, their correctional entities. So this is, you know, we're talking about county jails, but also their county welfare departments. County welfare departments in California are, are tasked with uh, providing the administrative enrollment component for all Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So, so they're actually the entities that will facilitate enrollment in Medi-Cal. Some county jails have pretty well established relationships with their county welfare departments to facilitate this, this enrollment and application assistance. Others are using um, outside CBOs or enrollment assisters who can perhaps help with the applications and then, then they get submitted kind of through the, the, the same system. Um, and finally, and, and counties can make different choices about how to target enrollment assistance. Who amongst their jail population would they like to target to help connect to, to health insurance coverage? Um, and the, you know, there, there, there are challenges and trade-offs that, that you can think about in trying to think about who these target groups might be. Um, you, know, you could think about, let's throw the widest net we possibly can, uh, target everyone who's coming into the jail system through the booking process. This would be the largest group. Um, in that case, you may only be able to provide, you know, maybe do a, a, a brief screen for, do you have coverage? Hey, here's some information about what might be available to you. Um, or you could think about really focusing on uh, the reentry population. So people who the jail system is already kind of providing reentry programming to as part of their planning process in people transitioning from the jail back to the community, they can have health insurance enrollment be, be a component of that. That might be more intensive. Um, might be able to do follow-up to ensure that people are enrolled, but it would be a much, a much smaller group. Um, another way in which jails um, are or may target um, different groups are focusing on people who may have high needs for, for health coverage or treatment. These could be physical health needs, whether maybe a person has exhibited really some, some condition that requires that they be transferred to a hospital while in custody and receive services. You know, they can be targeted for enrollment purposes or people who are transitioning into the community that have identified mental health conditions, have been taking medications within the jail system, and so they want to connect them to coverage and then to providers in order to provide that continuity of care once they're back in the community. Um, and so you know, different, different county systems in, in coordination with other agencies and priorities um, are deciding how best to, to target these enrollment activities. And so again, we're going to turn to the MCS data for 2014. And so as I said, one option is maybe to cast this really wide net. And so what we saw in 2014 from our MCS data is almost half a million individuals had contact, at least one contact, with uh, one of the 12 county jail systems that, that we're studying. Um, and so there, if you wanted to cast the widest net, you could use the booking process to come in. But what we see here is that nearly three quarters, 70 1.9% have only one contact. And so that would be the way that you would reach, reach the most people, but you may not have a lot of time to reach them. Um, and you might only be able to provide minimal, minimal assistance to such, such a large group. 
Um, I'll also point out in the pie chart that we see there is this, while most people do only have one contact or one booking into a county jail over the course of the year, there's this relatively small group, 3.5%, um, who had five or more contacts with county jail systems over the year. And while 3% is a pretty small number when we apply it to that total that total group, um, it winds up being about 14,000 individuals. And so that's another potential target group. And, and these are, you know, you, you can imagine some portion of this 14,000 being those folks that we think of, you know, in the, in the health world, we, the frequent flyers at your emergency departments, people with high mental health needs that are, that are touching the jails quite a lot, going in and out of, of the county jails. They might be a group to try to target enrollment assistance, see if they can't get into supportive housing or these other things. Um, and I will mention that there are several counties that um, are really targeting pretty small groups, but in part, part of the way they're targeting who to serve with really comprehensive services is looking at the number of contacts they have with their jails and their emergency departments. And that's really to try to find folks that are, you know, using and consuming a large portion of county resources and for trying to figure out better ways um, to have them not consume as, as many resources. Um, and, and finally, this is, this is just to go, oh, this is just to give you a sense again when we talked about the size of the group um, and who you could target. So the first bar here, this is, this is showing how much time people spend, the share of people and the time they spend in, in the county jail systems uh, for, the, for the people that we observe in, in our data. And so, you know, this, this, this first bar is that what I'll call the front door group. That's who we've been kind of looking at as our jail population in 2014 throughout the presentation. Um, and what we see here is that almost 30% spend less than one day in, in custody. Um, and so while you hopefully might be able to give them some information about options, that would likely be about as far as you could go. Another very large group, I have, you know, more than 40% are between two and 14 days. And so while you could, re, you know, you could say engage or reach a large group, the intensity of the enrollment assistance would likely be rather limited if you were focusing on this large booking group. Um, in contrast, we this is the, we refer to that as the front door, a front door model or a front door approach to enrollment assistance. Um, this back door group, um, a, about 71,000 individuals. Um, these are inmates who have been sentenced and are being released during 2014. So they've served their jail sentence and are being released um, from jails in 2014, about 71,000 individuals. And what you see there, as you would likely expect, is people stay, have, have much longer, longer stays in custody. Um, so let's see. 25% or more are, have been in the jail system more than 60 days. And so with that length of stay, you could imagine, hopefully, the ability to um, have people complete an application to perhaps get that application submitted um, to the county welfare department and do some follow-up to see whether you were able to have the person get enrolled in Medi-Cal and also potentially help facilitate some connections to um, to primary care providers, how they can how, how they can receive services once they are once they are going back into the community. And so, kind of to wrap up, um, as the ACA continues to to roll out and and uh, be implemented in California, uh, it's likely that further reductions in the uninsured uh, may require kind of alternative or or new thinking on enrollment strategies and and how to reach. Um, particular populations that still do continue to have high uninsured rates. Um, it's important also that we continue to kind of track how county correctional systems are doing under realignment, how they're managing their larger responsibilities, also understanding how, how efforts um, to improve reentry outcomes, to reduce recidivism with this, you know, coordination of different services um, is, is impacting those, those rates of, of rearrest or continued contact with criminal justice systems. Um, and what we really want to be able to do moving forward is to identify effective strategies, right? And, and that's really what our correctional group at PPIC is doing with the MCS study. But it's also something that we kind of hope to do with this crossover work between understanding how counties are trying to enroll jail populations and how that might impact their outcomes uh, in the future. Um, 
and so you know this is kind of the the, the first step in in continuing investigations that we plan to do in this area our next phase of work um, is really focused on going into the 12 counties that we're working with around all of this data to understand in depth what they're doing um, how they differ across counties in terms of what strategies they're using who they're partnering with and those sorts of things so we have a fair amount of information on them but we really want to in a much more qualitative in depth sense understand challenges that they're facing and what's going on to enroll people um, who pass through through the jails and then also to see how those different practices and strategies affect actual enrollment amongst those who are going who are in our county jails into the medical program and so that's kind of where we're hoping to go you know and then eventually also how that coverage can translate into improved access to healthcare services, to better treatments, and, and you know, the things that, that should come from those. So with that, I will finish. Um, I'd also, I'd like to invite uh, my co-author Mia Bird up for the questions and answers. Um, we have some folks um, in the back of the microphone, so if you could, if you have questions. Hi. Oh. I was just curious, um, when you think your study will be done on evaluating the 12 counties uh, qualitatively? Oh, within the next year. We kind of hate to give hard deadlines on things, but I mean, we are going out into the counties this summer. Um, and so we really do kind of plan where we're, we're actively working on that component of the project. So, you know, I mean, optimistically, shorter but but clearly I think we'll, we'll have some some good information on that and, and have it be be out uh, in the next in the next year yeah I think you know we're interested really in in two questions the first is what kind of strategies are working in terms of enrollment outcomes and that will be an easier question to answer enrollment is so immediate um, so we hope to answer that within the next year and then I think a little bit longer term is and what effect does that enrollment have on recidivism and are we seeing recidivism reduction and sort of given the windows you want to look at in order to really evaluate recidivism that work will take a little bit longer. Um, you know one of the things that you didn't point out which is one of the um, problems is in California once you enroll in Medi-Cal you then go through something called health care options where you have to choose your plan. You're often out of jail before you get an enrollment packet, and I, they could be sending it to you under a bridge, where you choose a health plan that takes 30 days to get back. If you don't choose, then you're assigned to a plan mm -hmm. which may be totally inappropriate for your substance abuse or whatever your problem is. And then you have up to, a, I think it's 150 days for this process. By that time, you're already back in jail. So under the Affordable Care Act Cover California, you apply for the health plan. It used to be that way with healthy families. You don't go through health care options, so you choose a plan. If when you enroll in Medi-Cal, you could also choose your health plan, then you would actually get connected to care when you leave. That's not what happens now. So even enrolling people, it doesn't do much good because you never get connected actually with uh, health care that way. No, I mean, and thank you for kind of filling that picture out because that, that's very true, kind of the assignment to a, to a plan, to a primary care provider, actually getting connected to someone who can help you navigate the system and the services. I think, and that's, um, you know, maybe that's ripe for, for some changes um, in terms of policy changes that could be made. 82% of the people in L.A. County don't choose a plan. It's 67% statewide, and yet the contract with healthcare options, I think, is $80 million a year through DHCS. So there's some big disconnect. That's, that's true. Although I, I will say this, and this was something I think that the, uh, in LA County at least, I mean, they are trying to focus on understanding how they can assist their jail populations, not cycle back in. Um, and so maybe they can find ways to try to connect people or provide more intensive enrollment assistance to the group. I mean, maybe you can get someone in, connected to a primary care provider while they're still in custody. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a good point. I, I, and I will say one final thing on that. You know, they, they passed legislation a few years ago where Medi-Cal enrollment isn't supposed to be terminated when you enter jail. So if people, if we are able to get people at least 
tentatively enrolled, their coverage can be suspended while they're in jail, and then maybe some of that can happen. But no, you make a very, very good point that that in order to really have hopefully this this matter in some ways, more needs to be done to connect people to providers and and the services. Yeah, if I can just address that point real quickly. In Sacramento, we have eligibility specialists at the jail, and we have them in our probation offices. I work for probation. I've also done a little bit of a study of the population that comes to our adult court building at 7-Eleven East Street, and the majority of that population, virtually all of that population, by the time they left the jail and report to us, have been enrolled. And for those that have not been enrolled, we have eligibility specialists that are our field operations building. So that's one way that Sacramento has worked towards getting this population enrolled at the point of release. And the sheriff deserves a lot of credit. I can't speak for them because I don't work for them, but they were um, involved in this project from the startup and getting those specialists into their facility. No, that's great. Thank you. So, you know, that's that's the kind of things that we, we need to know more about and how that's going in on the ground and in the counties and, and within our, our correctional system. So, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the funding sources that are used for to support these enrollment efforts. And you talked about some different funding sources, including uh, public safety realignment funds, county general funds, and then the state and federal Medi-Cal Medi administrative assistance funds. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that counties would want to maximize the state and federal dollars that they're getting. And so I'm curious why they might be using these other sources. Do you have a sense of whether it's because they don't maybe understand how to pull down those state and federal dollars, or is it that they're doing things that aren't eligible for the administrative? You know, that's that's rules. a great question. I think it's something that we want to learn more when we go out to the counties. I mean, I will say at least what, I, what little I know about kind of how the counties and the administration is still going under the Affordable Care Act. They're still trying to figure out with the computer systems and all of the things how to just manage the enrollments that they have. Um, and so I don't know how this piece intersects with that. Um, and so, you know, I don't know whether they're already feeling like they're maxing out what they can on the administrative, on the, on the Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal, federal, state administrative match. Um, and so kind of they need this extra money in order to even consider kind of expanding to, to serve this larger group. Um, uh, yeah, it seems to me, I mean, my take on the, the, the county piece is there, it's still shaking out the computer systems, how they're managing kind of this larger than they expected influx of, of enrollments, right? Um, and so perhaps down the road, as that smooths out more, you could, you could imagine this group being kind of rolled into that. Um, but that's definitely one of the questions um, when we go to the counties to, to learn more about how they're doing it administratively with their, with their county welfare departments. No, I think that's a good, a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, these are great numbers, and so I was just wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about um, the larger project and the different things you're going to pull out. I mean, because these are great numbers, looking at how many people go through the jails and you know the connection with Medi-Cal and what, what could happen. So it sounds like you're going to be collecting some more really specific information about the different counties. And because like the uh, drug medical uh, rollout that's going on, which is beginning in the Bay Area County, so it's going to be different around the state. So anyway, if you could just talk a little bit more about your broader project. Thanks. So sure. The broader project um, was really around first trying to understand what the effects of realignment were, um, particularly with respect to recidivism because so many individuals were moving from the lens of state view down to the county level. And the fear was, well, it'd be very hard to really evaluate outcomes since we have these siloed county systems. So that was sort of the motivation initially. Um, and one of the, the big things that we wanted to sort of work with the BSCC, and also we're collaborating with the DOJ and CDCR, they're providing data to the project and these 12 counties, was to really fulfill kind of that promise of realignment, which is that there are evidence-based practices, we can find them, we can identify them, and then we can implement them in order to sort of maximize the return on our resources and improve outcomes. And so what we were starting with, though, is just a lot of data systems that had largely been used to manage populations that were with them for relatively short terms. 
And so what we needed to do is to work with counties to translate those data systems into the kinds of data that you can use to do evaluation and to really identify what is the effect of this service or this program. Does it vary depending on who gets it based on their needs or their characteristics or that sort of thing? So specific to sort of health issues and health interventions, we're trying to look at um, capture both sort of where counties are doing needs assessments when people are coming through either the jail system or into the probation system, looking at the, that information that comes from the needs assessments, and then also looking at the kind of programming they're getting while they're in jails the kind of reentry services they're being connected to before they leave jails, and similarly through the probation system, the kinds of referrals they're getting and the kind of services they're connecting to, to try to understand you know, where we're seeing positive impacts, where we're seeing unmet needs, um, and where there's sort of potential to start to build this evidence basis from within and to continuously sort of improve in terms of how we're targeting those services and programs. Yeah. Person, and I don't really know all the details of the realignment. So, are all the counties required to do a needs assessment? No, they're so, it's, not, so they're whatever not they're doing is up to. Each There's county. quite a bit of, um, you know, my perspective from the 12 counties we're working with, we're working with two agencies within each county, probation and sheriff's departments right now. <clears throat> um, there, is, there are a lot of limitations and constraints, and um, there are a lot of barriers to moving forward with risk and needs assessments and connecting people to services, but there is also a great deal of openness to rethinking how these things are done and the value of, say, assessments, the value of services, how to start really identifying what's having the most impact, what they can do to have the most impact. So I would say it's not being done everywhere, but there's an openness to doing it if we can demonstrate that it's valuable. Given the very high numbers of be, uh, percentages of behavioral health concerns, is this is a new part of healthcare coverage, and the effectiveness and availability of behavioral health services will really affect the outcomes. Is anyone tracking effectiveness and availability? Yes. Well, I you know I we participated in um, kind of a, a collaborative research meeting um, kind of being organized by the Californians for Safety and Justice. But um, I know what some one of the groups, the Advancement Project, is that? Mm -hmm. I, I know that that's one of the elements that they're trying to, to incorporate is understanding what, say, capacity is available, uh, particularly to correctional populations. So you make a good point, and actually I think it was in some of my notes that I, that I didn't, you know. I mean, part of the drug medical overhaul and this integration of services really is about trying to make sure there's adequate providers, which I think a lot of areas and places are, are struggling with, right? But there is at least policy focus now or, you know, the, the attempts to try to, to improve those. Um, but it's it's a good point. Capacity, uh, treatment capacity, is is going to be is going to be an issue, um, and it will likely be different across California, which is something that we see kind of across the board uh, for health and mental health, and and actually most things. But um, no, it's a it's a good it's a good comment. Um, a while back, there was a fair amount of tuberculosis among some of the homeless populations. I was wondering if someone is in jail, and <coughs> say they're in jail for 30 days, okay. and it's found that they have tuberculosis, mm -hmm. and they don't have insurance, um, what policies should be put in place to help that person so that they can get care and remain being seen medically when they get out? I think, you know, in an ideal case, we might imagine that that person is assisted with enrollment in insurance and is connected to longer term case management upon release, whether that be through a probation department or if they're not under probation supervision through out of custody case management. Um, but that takes a lot of resources. And so, you know, in order to think clearly about how we allocate resources, we need to understand, well, what would the effect of that be? And so that's why we're out there searching for sort of different strategies that people have tried, maybe in small numbers, maybe in a few locations that we can use to really try to understand, well, if you do do all of those things, 
then what happens? Do you see a reduction in recidivism? Do you see improvements in other outcomes? And how can we kind of value those outcomes in order to think about the best way to allocate sort of the limited resources the correctional system has at its disposal? And I'd also just add that, you know, <coughs> county, county and state departments of public health, public health track infectious disease and um, including these sorts of things. And they do at least have some some knowledge of the fact that that our correctional institutions do have high high rates of, of infectious disease and so kind of understanding how they might be able to engage it particularly at the county level you have county correctional systems and you have county departments of public health tasked with tracking infectious disease so you know i do think that there are likely efforts um, that are going on in different counties given you know depending on resources and relationships and all those other things trying to figure out how to do that because if people are coming through and you have high rates of infectious disease and then folks move back out into the community i mean there is this back and forth that has some serious public health implications and you know there are there are agencies that are that are tasked with trying to manage that public health aspect so i do think you know they they try to to work with with the correctional sites as well to to see how best to manage that One, one other issue is data sharing between the state and the counties. When people go up to the state, their medical records don't follow them and vice versa. So there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent on redoing tests and assessments when, because there's no way of transferring those records, which would be a much more cost-effective way than redoing everything. And also it would be easier, I think, if people, particularly in the mental health, if they had the records with them, then the counties would know exactly what this person mm -hmm. is getting when they return to the community. I couldn't agree more. And sure. this is also an issue between local health systems and local jail systems. And I do think, you know, what we're seeing is that this is an issue ripe for federal support. There's no federal money. Yeah, and, you know, counties we've talked to anecdotally have initiated some programs and then had trouble actually pulling down those funds. So it's, it's something that I know we want to look into more yeah. and that I hope other folks will look into as well that have more expertise. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the other thing, and we, this is something particularly, but PBIC really, the data sharing, the kind of understanding how, how you can build out data resources for people to, you know, for agencies to better manage their programs and things, but also to understand what works is important. And it, particularly in this area, federal, whether it's funds, but it's also guidance. You know, there's a lot of concern and a lot of times that stops people before they even try to think about what they can do. So it's just HIPAA and then now we're going to stop, right? And so I, I will say this, there are different organizations, uh, I think the Urban Institute has kind of put together a pretty big package of information trying to think about all the different um, places where people might want to share information with regard to health and correctional systems, so across all sorts of different types of health providers, um, and kind of trying to think through what federal and state laws might apply to that data, how to share it and stuff. So there are folks that are trying to really think through. Because um, I think in some ways the counties that we talked to, just guidance on what they can and can't do, how they can and can't do it, um, would be helpful as well. I'm sure you can just ask us, Brandon. Oh. Yeah. Go for I'm, it. I'm <laughs> and you're very close. <laughs> Uh, I'm just wondering if you've started to look at or think through how, how Prop 47 changes all this. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a huge challenge um, in the sense that a lot of advocates for healthcare services really feel like you, we needed that stick. We needed something stronger um, in order to sort of get people into treatment programs. And, you know, on the other side, there are many advocates that say, you know, that kind of approach to getting people into treatment programs isn't really effective and is more harmful. So it's really an open question, and it's going to be a tricky thing to study. We certainly can look at outcomes for people who are still coming through the system on Prop 47 offenses, but there's a lot of people that we can't really see. You know, those people that aren't being arrested anymore, they're not being booked anymore. Um, you know, what is happening in terms of their outcomes, and that's going to mean a lot of pa partnering with treatment providers and healthcare agencies to try to understand sort of the bigger picture. 
BSCC just established their steering committee on Prop 47. Are you guys involved with any of that, um, developing recommendations for expenditure on the county level when they do decide to divvy it out? You know, what we've done so far is just to talk with BSCC and provide some guidance on thinking about how counties that receive funding or entities that receive funding can evaluate that the impacts of how they use that funding. So how to start right from the beginning when you're planning a program to really understand sort of the logic model of that intervention that you want funding for, and then to be able to see the points at which you should be collecting data so that you can then understand the effects. So that's kind of, that's our little world of, you know, data and outcomes. <laughs> Will that include like programs that are already established or just brand new programs? I, I mean, we're certainly not in a role to make any decisions on that, but um, I think potentially you could imagine using that model for either. So you might have a program in place that you haven't really thought about evaluating before, and so you're gonna bring that extra layer on for the, as you move forward. Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you all.